हेलो गुड मॉर्निंग Do you want me to start? Satya, uh, 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 kindly mute your mic. Uh, wait, wait for a moment. A uh, ten-step to- uh, solution, multidisciplinary research starter, focused on advanced education and research in the field of technology, engineering, maths, and science. We have to be a very responsible member to those who keep their trust with the solution. We organize business in a way that is inclusive, transparent, and respectful for the last six years. Teams also provide training and development opportunity for various students of the community. Here we are welcome Dr. Hasima Hasan from NASA to share the vast experience space technology. I am here to share few facts about Dr. Hasima Hasan. Hashima Hasan is a NASA program scientist for nuclear spectroscopy and an imaging X-ray polymeric explorer that takes observatory and astrophysics data curation and actual research program and is deputy program scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope. She serves as the education and communication lead for astrophysics and as the executive secretary of the Astrophysics Advisory Committee. In her role as a program scientist, she makes sure that each project's mission remains possible and true to NASA's strategic objectives. Her husband has been the program scientist for many other NASA missions, such as Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, Gravity, and Extreme Magnetism (SMEX). Status Status Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. Hubble Space Telescope Explorer Program from 2001 to 2006. Hassan also served as a lead for astronomy and physics research and analysis programs. Hassan received a doctorate from the University from Oxford, UK in theoretical nuclear physics. Till 1985, Dr. Hassan conducted postdoctoral research and held teaching position in the area of theoretical nuclear physics. And in environmental science, she was the optical telescope assembly scientist at Space Telescope Science Institute, Baltimore, until 1994. When she joined NASA headquarters, she also attended Harvard University, Kennedy School of Government, Senior Executive Fellow Program, and the Federal Executive Institute. She received certification for the Senior Executive Service in 2004. Hasan has published articles in various peer-reviewed journals such as Astrophysical Journal, Icarus, and publication of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. She has been honored with prestigious award and fellowship throughout her outstanding career, including the NASA Headquarters Exceptional Performance Award in 2008, the National Research Council President Research Associate from 1981 to 1983. Commonwealth Fellowship from 1973 to 1976 and received a gold medal for physics and merit award as a student. Now I am giving that things to Dr. Hasim Hasan. Now we will start your session now. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Namaskar. Thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction. It really is a pleasure and an honor for me to be here uh, to talk to you about uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. So I will start with uh, telling you something about the science and why we are doing James Webb, and then go a little bit, uh, sort of a glimpse into the technology. There isn't time to cover everything, and then finally, I, I, I will just. tell you what our next telescope is going to be so if i may share my screen okay so can you see my screen yes ma'am we can 
Just a minute, let me get to the first slide. Okay. Here we go. Okay, so we think of the James Webb Space Telescope as uh, as NASA's infrared uh, eyes on the telescope, uh, I mean, on the universe. And it's a um, uh, um, partnership with uh, between NASA, the European Space Agency, ESA, and the Canadian Space Agency, CSA. And uh, Webb is really a technological wonder which will enable humankind to unlock some of the mysteries of the formation of the early universe. And it's a tribute to the ingenuity and creativity of the human mind. With its 6.5 meter primary mirror and four powerful instruments, it, it has already begun the study of the first stars and galaxies, atmospheres of extrasolar planets, and helping us learn where elements that form life came from and much, much more. So uh, these are the four science goals of JWST. Uh, the first one is that it will uh, uh, enable us to detect and study the formation of the first stars and galaxies, which were created 13.6 billion years ago following the evolution and to help us follow the evolution of the galaxies, help us study black holes by capturing the light from them that has stretched out into the infrared. And it will also use its infrared capability to study the birthplaces of stars with, uh, with much more details than it's been done before. And it will help us to study uh, planetary systems which form our uh, and, and see how they form and in, involve, and also to discover extrasolar planets, that is, planets around other stars, and study their atmospheres and see if they are habitable, if humans can live on them. And uh, it, JWST will also observe the, uh, the gas giant planets in our own solar system, such as Jupiter uh, that you can see on the right, and also we'll be able to study their moons and the composition of asteroids and Kuiper belt objects. So how does Webb do it? Its specialization is in the infrared. Just to remind you, here's the spec uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, Hubble observes in the ultraviolet and goes up to the near infrared. Webb will uh, observe from the near infrared into the mid infrared. And Spitzer, which has now been turned off, observed from the mid-infrared into the far infrared. So we were able to, between these three observatories, cover from ultraviolet up to uh, the far infrared. And we've had uh, other observatories which go into X-rays. In fact, the Chandra telescope, uh, named after uh, the Indian-American uh, Chandra Shekhar, is still operating. It observes in X-rays. And, and we have other smaller telescopes. So how, how does uh, infrared help us uh, study starbirth? Here's an example of three images taken by Hubble, uh, two of them taken by Hubble and the third by uh, Spitzer. So the first image on the left is of uh, what is known as the e Eagle Nebula. And uh, here you uh, cannot see uh, stars being born in, in the dusty columns uh, because they're hidden by the dusty columns. And this is an image in the visible. In the middle is an image in the near infrared. And the infrared light penetrates the dust. And we are able to see new stars being born. And on the right hand is a mid-infrared image taken by Spitzer. And you can see the dust clouds, how they are beginning to dissolve from the heat of the newly born stars. So this is really the power of infrared for examining starbirth. So let's see what uh, so far what we've seen in in from Webb. Here is that same nebula uh, in uh, taken 
by uh, image taken by Webb. And here you can see much more details of star formation. You can see new stars being formed in the des dense clouds. And you can see how the columns uh, of dust, uh, of interstellar dust, appear. And at sometimes they even look transparent. And so, uh, so we are really big, already beginning to learn a lot more about star birth from uh, web images. We're also learning more about the death of stars. Here's a picture of the planetary nebula, uh, and uh, and you and you can see on the left hand side is a near infrared image taken by Webb's near infrared camera and on the right hand side is an Im image taken by webb's mid infrared camera and it, it uh, th this nebula uh, which is called the southern ring ne nebula has been observed by other telescopes by ground ground based telescopes as well as hubble but in these images you we see a lot more detail than we saw with uh, with the hubble and on the left hand side, you can see the expanding um, uh, layers of gas. Uh, these are there are two stars in the center orbiting each other. And as they orbit uh, and the uh, fainter star is the older star, which has been throwing out as it dies, it throws out uh, 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 gas rings. And, and and as they orbit these rings, uh, uh, turn into each other. And on the right hand side, you can is a mid infrared, and you can start seeing more details of the dust rings, dust envelopes. So, how do we observe the ancient red in, in infrared? So, as the universe uh, uh, expands, the light which started in stars on the right hand side as blue and ultraviolet. By the time it has reached us 13.6 billion years later, it has stretched into the infrared because as the universe expands, the light also expands. And it's this infrared light from the newborn stars, which were uh, the first stars uh, which were born, which is detected by Webb. Uh, Webb also uh, uh, examines spectra. So spectra give us a lot of information. And here is uh, uh, an example of a spectrum of, of this um, uh, nebula. And uh, you can see by examining the spectrum, we can see what, what is, are the components of this object. In this particular case, we see oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur. Also by examining spectra, we can and measure the speeds at which the objects are moving, whether they're moving closer to us or further to, from us. So Webb has both cameras and spectrographs. So it looks at images as well as spectra. So let us remind uh, ourselves of the timeline of the evolution of the universe. So the Big Bang happened 13.8 years, uh, billion years ago. So, so what was the Big Bang? At that time, the entire mass and energy of the universe was compressed into a very tiny <clears throat> spot called, the, uh, called a singularity. And that singularity suddenly started expanding. And the scientists have na named that phenomenon Big Bang, not because there was a big loud sound, but because there was a, this very sudden expansion. And as the uh, universe started expanding, it was a hot soup of uh, uh, first elementary particles were, for, were formed, and then uh, they started combining to, find, to form hydrogen, and then the hydrogen atoms st uh, started uh, combining to form gas. And as the gas clouds uh, com uh, combined, and they started compressing, uh, collapsing with with gravity, nuclear reactions started taking place, and the first stars were born. And this happened about 400 million years after the Big Bang. So we think it may be somewhere between 200 to 400 million years. And then after that, as uh, uh, you know, galaxies started forming. So uh, Hubble has so far been able to see back up to 
maybe about uh, five, 500 million years after the Big Bang. But Webb will go right up to the first stars and galaxies. So here is an image taken by Webb, which is one of the first images taken of uh, called the uh, uh, Webb's uh, deep field. And the, uh, the galaxies in the front is called the SPAC 0723. This is about 4.6 billion years from the Earth. And here we see a lot of details over here. And, we, uh, and uh, as the astronomers start analyzing it, we will be learning more about the ancient galaxies and how they involved, evolved. So far, uh, they have identified a galaxy which was formed 13.1 billion years ago. It's just a very preliminary calculation. It hasn't been confirmed yet. And you see little arcs over there. Uh, and those are formed. Uh, what we call gravitational lensing. The, when you have a very big galaxy in the front of, of, uh, of another galaxy behind, then the light from the galaxy at the back gets bent by gravity of the bigger galaxy in the front. And, and, its, image, and its images are formed in the front. So you are in, in, and using that technique, which is called gravitational lensing, uh, astronomers are able to study galaxies which are very far away and which would not have been uh, possible to study without this uh, studying this phenomena. So there are a lot of different techniques uh, astronomers use. So here is, is an image also taken by Webb of interacting galaxies. These are called Stephen's Quintet. Again, this has been studied before, but in this image, uh, you see a lot more details. You can start seeing star birth on the. You can see on the right hand side, uh, between the uh, you know two clusters on the right, you see a lot of star birth taking place. You can see uh, as as astronomers study this in more detail, you can see uh, how uh, you know evolution of the galaxies is taking place because of the interactions. So we, we, we are learning a lot more. And uh, in the previous image and also in this, uh, spectra have also been taken. So by studying those spectra, we will be learning more about these early galaxies and how they formed and evolved. Webb will also help us find distant planets. Here, the image on the right is actually showing uh, extrasolar planets which were discovered by the Keck telescope in Hawaii. And uh, Webb will be able to uh, uh, discover more planets uh, than, than uh, the ground-based telescopes and get more details of them. And here is an image of the first direct image that uh, has been taken of, of an extrasolar planet. And this was taken by the Webb telescope. And here you see four images which are taken in four different uh, wavelengths, two with a near-infrared camera and two with a uh, mid-infrared camera. And as the astronomers start analyzing this, we will be able to learn more about uh, planets around other stars. And this is just gives a demonstration of the capability of Webb to take direct images of planets around uh, other stars, which has not been really possible until now with this kind of detail and clarity. Webb will also be able to uh, uh, decode planetary atmospheres. Here is, uh, just as an example, a simulated atmosphere of, of the uh, Earth that if uh, you were to go uh, far away and take a uh, 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 spectrum of the Earth's atmosphere, this is what it would look like. So if we take spectra of other planets, we'll find out what is uh, uh, what the atmosphere is composed of. And here is a, a first image uh, taken by Webb of, uh, of a of the atmosphere of, of a planet. And here we can already see that Webb has got this beautiful spectra, which is showing that this uh, extrasolar planet has uh, water on it. And so we, uh, this is just an example. It's one of the first images of Webb, that the capability of Webb to measure 
uh, the planet. So Webb is already delivering on its science uh, goals. So the fourth goal was to re-examine our solar system. And here are two examples of what Webb has already done. This is a view of Jupiter taken by Webb. Uh, it has shown us details of the aurora on the poles of Webb. We can see the, a light ring around Jupiter and also uh, two of its uh, uh, um, moons, Andresta and Amalthea. And uh, so uh, uh, astronomers will be getting a lot more knowledge learning about Jupiter. Here is a, a picture of Saturn's moon. This was just observed earlier in, 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 in of last month on 4th of November. The, the top image is a web image which shows uh, uh, the uh, two clouds, uh, cloud A and cloud B. And immediately, you know, uh, uh, a Keck observatory was alerted also to look at this moon two days later to see how those uh, clouds move. So. Uh, so, to, uh, you know, so observatories, both space-based and ground-based together, uh, can work it, to tell us more about uh, objects in the universe. And tracking the clouds over Saturn gives us an insight how the air is flowing in the Saturn's atmosphere. And it's, uh, uh, the you know, in our solar system, it's the only moon known, so far known, to have a dense atmosphere. So that was just a glimpse of, you know, how Hubble, is, uh, sorry, how Webb is beginning to uh, deliver on its science goals. So let's uh, look a little bit uh, on, how, uh, on the technology of the telescope. So uh, th this, as I mentioned, is a partnership with, with ESA and CSA and its prime contractor. It was built by uh, Northrop Grumman Space Systems in California. Uh, we have four science instruments, uh, uh, the near infrared camera, which is a NASA instrument. Then uh, there's a European instrument, the near infrared spectrograph, a Canadian instrument, fine guidance sensor and slitless spectrograph. And then there's a joint uh, uh, instrument, the mid infrared instrument. And um, so, on the right hand side just gives a, a, a diagram of the uh, telescope. So this is a feat of engineering and the, a lot of very groundbreaking technology went into it, but I'm just going to mention two of them, the mirror and the sun shield. So the primary mirror of the uh, web is 6.5 meters and compared to Hubble, which is 2.4 meters. And this, you can think of the mirror as being the most important part of the telescope because the mirror is, you can think of it as like a light, light bucket. It collects light. And the more light you collect, the further back you can see and, and the fainter objects you can see and the more detail you can see if you collect more light. So, uh, so that gives... Uh, web it, it's you know making it much more powerful than smaller telescopes so the design is that it's got an elliptical primary mirror the 6.5 meter mirror then there is a secondary mirror the light bounces off from the primary onto the secondary which is a hyperbolic mirror and then it goes on to a tertiary mirror an elliptical tertiary mirror and the need for a tertiary mirror is that since it's the primary mirror is so large, the edges in, introduce uh, a, an error which needs to be an optical error which needs to be corrected. And so the tertiary mirror corrects that error. And then there's a flat fine steering mirror which corrects for vibrations in the telescope. And after that, it goes into the science instruments. So on the left hand side is a ray diagram for those who are interested in optics. Uh, uh, it, it shows you how, how the rays uh, go from the primary, secondary, tertiary, and then uh, finally into the science instruments. But I wanted to talk about the two images on the right-hand side. The one on the top shows the back of one of the primary mirror segments. Uh, now, uh, the primary mirror is made of 18 
hexagonal segments. It's not one solid uh, uh, piece of uh, you know material like uh, the web mirror, uh, like the Hubble mirror, but it is composed of 18 pieces of uh, uh, hexagonal elements. And the one on the top hand side shows the back of one of those elements, and it has uh, tiny motors called actuators at each of its six ends and one in the center. And those are there to adjust uh, the shape of the mirror, fine adjustments in it, so that when all 18 pieces are put together, they can act as one mirror. And uh, on the lower hand side is, is uh, showing the mirror which is placed it, it coming out of a chamber. There's a great, great big chamber at Johnson Space Center in Houston, where this optics of the telescope was tested. So we learned a lesson when Hubble was uh, uh, made. We did not test its optics. And so there was a problem which had to be fixed later. But uh, with Webb, uh, we had to test the optics because we cannot send any fixes. So here's a picture of the one of the segments of the mirror. It's made of a material called beryllium, uh, which is very hard and, and very strong. And also, it has a low coefficient of expansion, which means it can go from hot and cold uh, without changing shape. And it's very stiff. So, so th that material was used to make um, the uh, web mirrors. So here is a, is a video showing how the mirror was put together. There was a back plane, and that each of the segments was uh, uh, put in, in, in place robotically. And, and so, so. And see one by one. Of course, it, it took much longer than a couple of minutes that we are seeing here. And this was done at Goddard Space Flight, Flight Center in Maryland. The, the mirror pieces uh, were sent by the manufacturers to Goddard, and they were put together in Goddard in a clean room over there. And each mirror is coated with, with gold. And the reason it's coated with gold is that gold reflects infrared light. And uh, Webb is an infrared telescope. So we needed a material which would reflect infrared light. So here the mirror has been put together. And then it was displayed in the clean room in Goddard Space Center. And here I'm standing in front of the uh, viewing window of the clean room. So this give, just gives you an idea of how huge the mirror is. It's very dramatic. So let's talk about the sun shield. So uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, as you can see, the design of this telescope, it's not enclosed in a tube. It was not possible to do that. So, it, But it has to be kept very, very cold because uh, it uh, detects infrared light. And uh, so we don't want the heat of uh, radiated by the telescope, its own internal heat, to interfere with, with the infrared light of the objects it is, has been designed to view. So for that reason, it has to be kept extremely cold. And so for that reason, a sun shield was designed. So it's, you can think of it like an umbrella being and under the uh, under the telescope and this faces the sun and on the lower right hand side you can see that it, one side of it is facing the sun and the earth and the moon so it stays really hot but the other side stays very cold so the hot side goes up to about 185 degrees fahrenheit and the cold side has to be minus 388 degrees fahrenheit so so this was a a uh, lot of uh, you know technology went in to develop the material for this and the coatings for it so the material is uh, kapton and there are five layers of the sun shield 
and each layer has you know they are coated with uh, different materials so here we are seeing uh, here the telescope and the sun shield are integrated i mean the uh, the primary mirror and 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 the instruments and the sun shield are integrated together to make the whole telescope and over here you show uh, we see uh, how the telescope was folded, uh, the mirror was folded together and the telescope was placed into the nose of the what is called the fairing of the rocket to be launched. Now, since this is such a huge um, mirror, uh, there's no rocket large enough to put a 6.5 meter mirror. So it had to be folded back. And, and that was a, a very clever technology when the scientists said that we want a 6.5 meter mirror the engineers had to think how to make a 6.5 meter mirror which can be launched in in a launch vehicle which is not big enough so so that's why they came up with this very clever design so this is how it was folded up put in the uh, nose of the vehicle before being launched so uh, just let me mention the four science instruments the near infrared spectrograph it studies uh, uh, distant galaxies and one uh, very groundbreaking technology that went into it is called what are called micro uh, uh, shutters so so there are these sort of little teeny windows and each of them can be opened at, at depending on what uh, the astronomers want to study and it can take spectra of up to about a hundred objects at one time and so this is a very new and very groundbreaking technology which go which went into space then the near infrared uh, 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 slitless spectrograph the canadian instrument that that uh, specializes in studying the composition of extra extraterrestrial planets and distant galaxies and the near infrared camera will that is really the workhorse instrument it studies the earliest stars and galaxies and processes of formation as well as uh, our solar system objects and the mid infrared op in, in, instrument is studies cooler objects like debris disks around stars which emit most of the light in mis, mid infrared as well as extremely dis, distant galaxies whose lights have been shifted into the infrared so here are just some more details in case anyone is interested just telling you uh, the wavelengths and uh, capabilities and here's just a picture of the four instruments just to give you an idea of uh, of how complex they actually are to produce the magical science this, and here is the yeah. launch of the we telescope set. It, Six, this is five, uh, cap, it three, was launched two, from uh, unité, South America from the European spaceport. And the launch vehicle was a French vehicle from a tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself. James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. So that was a beautiful launch on December 25, Christmas Day last year. And this is a picture taken from the uh, rocket uh, of, uh, of the telescope as it leaves the rocket. So all of us heaved a sigh of relief when we saw that. And here is uh, a video which just shows you how Webb un unfolded when it went into space. So first the sun shield came out, then the high gain antenna, uh, then uh, uh, the struts for, for the sun shield, and then, uh, uh, th then the mirror, I mean, then the sun shield uh, uh, opened first one side, then the other side, and then the five layers separated and stretched. And and sorry, I, I I said when I said the first uh, element that came out, it was uh, what I meant to say was the solar array, not sun shield. So then, once the sun sun shield was finally stretched and ready, then the secondary mirror came out, then the primary mirror 
and then it was ready for um, uh, ready for observing. So here is a, a, a image showing uh, a figure showing where Webb's orbit is. It's a million miles from the Earth. Uh, the Hubble is in what is called, we called a low Earth orbit. It's only about three to four hundred miles from the Earth. It orbits the Earth, but uh, Webb orbits a point called L two. L2 is a semi-stable point where the gravity of the sun and the earth almost balance out each other. And so uh, 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 Webb orbits L2, and as, as the earth orbits the sun, L2 orbits the sun with it. And uh, it, it, this is a good point for, uh, for Webb to be because it, it's semi-stable. It can, uh, you know, uh, it's... And also, it's uh, the Earth doesn't obscure its view. It can it is able to view the sky the whole time, and it uh, faces uh, the sun, and uh, the sun shield keeps it cool. And also, it's it's far enough away so that it can keep the sun, uh, telescope cool, but it's close enough to the Earth that it can still communicate with the Earth. So, how does it talk to the Earth? It communicates, uh, uh, the uh, communi uh, communications uh, start, uh, go between the command center, which is in Baltimore, it's Space Telescope Science Institute, uh, uh, to Webb, and through, uh, the, uh, 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 through the high gain antenna at, uh, in California. So, uh, so from Baltimore, Baltimore communicates with the Goldstone in California, and there the messages are sent to Webb, and they come back from Webb to Goldstone and then into um, Baltimore. So that is the root of how we talk to Webb. Here is the command center in uh, Baltimore, Space Telescope Science Institute. So the Webb's commissioning process took about six months. It took about one month for Webb to arrive at well to L2, and then it had to cool, be cooled down. And then the alignment process took place before um, the and then the instruments were calibrated and the first images were taken. So the mirror alignment was done, uh, as I mentioned before, by uh, by uh, adjusting the curvature of the mirror. First, the uh, uh, images were acquired in each mirror, and then the mirrors were adjusted so, so that they were arranged in, in, in the correct pattern. And then each mirror was focused, and then the images were stacked. So here is a, a video showing the actual alignment, how it happened. So the individual segments were aligned and then each segment was focused and then the uh, segments were moved so that the images from each segment were stacked on each other to form one one fine image and you can see on the right side and that was the image and then that was focused and this was the final telescope aligned uh, alignment image. And then tel uh, the telescope was ready for, uh, yeah, and after that, each of the instruments were focused and then Webb was ready for image and we'd released our first images in July, which I'm sure all of you have seen. And I would like to remind you all that all the web data is archived in the Mikulski Archives to Space Telescopes. It's open to the public anywhere in the world. So any of you, anyone who wants to analyze web data or even Hubble data, just go to MAST, get the data, and analyze it. So it is yours. And before I end with this, and yes, here is a nice website. Uh, for people to just go around and explore about web. And then before I end, I want to mention our next telescope, the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, which we are building for launch in 27. And here's in the left is a quick infographic showing a comparison of the telescopes. 
the Roman telescope is also uh, uh, an infrared telescope, but it's got a very wide field of view, whereas Hubble views the cosmos in infrared, visible, and ultraviolet light and provides a high resolution view of individual objects. The Roman telescope will expand Hubble's infrared observations, you know, specifically using a much larger field of view to create enormous panoramas of the universe with the same resolution. And Webb also con uh, co uh, conducts high resolution, but it has a very uh, uh, small field of view, a narrower field of view. So uh, Roman will give us the bigger picture. It will give us planets by thousands, stars by billions, galaxies by millions, and fundamental physics, and of course, the unexpected. So thank you. Um, Ma'am, here the viewer having some questions. Okay. I will text you the question, ma'am. Are the questions in the chat or what? dark age image i'm not sure what you mean by dark age because uh, in the dark ages there was no no light escaped so we don't know what went on there so no we don't see images how long will it take to get images from the web uh, you mean how long do, does it take for it to come to Earth, well, it's it doesn't take long. It's it it's electromagnetic waves. So um, I would say it's almost instantaneous. But uh, uh, what what uh, limits is is that how much of the uh, you know uh, the capability of, of the deep space network, which is in uh, in uh, California, that has uh, to uh, uh, you know that has to be available, and and the telescope has to be in the right place to communicate with it. So it communicates with it. Uh, I I don't remember uh, how frequently it communicates with it. Uh, how how many? I, I think it it does a few passes in a day for it to go to uh, uh, go from. Uh, uh, web to to the deep space network and sometimes the deep space ne network is not available if it's being used say for artemis launch or something yeah what is the maximum range of taking pictures so um again as i said it has been designed to take uh, images which uh, go back to about uh, two or three hundred million years uh, from uh, back uh, to the universe. Uh, I mean, uh, after the Big Bang. So, yeah, it'll go back. It'll be its ranges, uh, the first stars and galaxies. So L1 and L2, these are called Lagrange points. And uh, these are points where the uh, uh, gravity of the Earth and the sun balance each other. And there are five Lagrange points. Some of them are stable. Some of them are semi-stable. So L2 is a, is a point where, which, and these have been named, uh, you know, uh, when, uh, uh, by the scientists who actually discovered them, and Lagrange was was a, was a scientist. I think he was a French scientist. So uh, L two is a, is the point which is uh, semi-stable, 
as I mentioned, and that's uh, that's where it is being placed. So that that's what I mean by L2. And uh, why are they hexagonal? That's a good question. Um, so uh, wh when the scientists wanted a 6.5 meter mirror, uh, it was uh, the, the engineers decided that the one of the ways they could do it was by doing these hexagonal pieces. Uh, the there are two mirrors in uh, on the Keck telescope in Hawaii. They're 10 meters in, in diameter. And uh, uh, these uh, were taken as an example. Now, if you take one large piece of 6.5 meters, even if it could be launched, it sags because it's really heavy, it sags. But if you have smaller pieces, they don't sag. And so they worked out to see which was the best way, best size and best shape, which could be put together to approximate a circular mirror. So that's how they decided on the hexagonal shape. Is big bag theory 100% true? Uh, well, uh, is it 100% true? I'm not sure what you mean by 100% true, but uh, uh, it's a theory, and uh, uh, every theory has to be, uh, uh, you know, supported by observations, and the observations of uh, with supporting the big bang theory so far. Uh, support it, and uh, and certainly, I mean, there are other theories out there also, and uh, and that's what science is about. And you have to find observations to support your theories. So so far, the observations are supporting uh, the Big Bang theory, uh, inflation. Can we see beyond 13.1 billion light years? Well, that certainly is the hope that we want to go up to 200 million years after the Big Bang, which is would be, which would be like 13.2, 13.3 billion years. How long will it take to get images from the Webb telescope? Um, I think this is uh, uh, this was the one which uh, I answered earlier. That uh, uh, it so uh, I can answer this in two ways because I don't know how, how you uh, you know what exactly you mean by the question. So how long does it take for the images from uh, from web to reach the command center? That uh, depends, you know, from from the web, it it is stored in its memory, and then the memory is dumped onto the uh, deep space network, the uh, antenna in in uh, in uh, uh, California, and when and that cal and that uh, antenna is, uh, I mean, that uh, antenna is not available all the time to web, and web has to be in the right direction to provide it. So it does about, I think three or four passes in the day when it dumps data into that and it's uh, uh, sent to uh, and it is sent to Space Telescope Science Institute and then it's put in in the uh, archives so if you want if you want data from the archives you just go and get it as soon as it is placed over there Due to gravitational lensing effect, the bodies appear to be side by side. So how do we really distinguish between body that are behind the body and the ones that are beside? Uh, I, they don't really appear side by side. They appear as uh, discs around them. And um, so it, uh, so the, uh, you know, one has to do the physics and understand that and uh, analyze it. And so, so, so the scientists analyze those images, and that's how they know uh, that they, they are images and uh, and not uh, um, actual bodies side by side. So it doesn't. Uh, it it, uh, it it 
the only power it needs is is for it to um uh, you know to go around l2 and it has fuel on board and that fuel is used for it to um, uh, orbit l2 and that will that fuel is expected to last for almost 20 years yeah the mirror is not made of gold uh, the mirror is made of beryllium but it is coated with a very thin layer of gold because gold reflects infrared light and uh, uh, web is designed to uh, to detect infrared light other may be used for copper silver and aluminum yeah no silver and aluminum uh, will not reflect infrared light so uh, that that's why one needs to coat it with gold it's a very very thin layer of gold about like hair's breadth well it's not a lot of gold when do we understand that the signal is 1 million years so, uh, so measuring um, uh, distances to uh, uh, to distant objects is uh, uh, there are many techniques uh, which have been evolved to measure those distances and uh, uh, and uh, one of them is spectra from the spectra you can determine how fast something is moving and uh, uh, which direction it's moving the distance from from the earth to different objects is uh, as i said th th there are different techniques we call call that the cosmic ladder and um, so that'll take a bit of time to explain it, to explain it power is generated by heat will be produced yes and uh, as as i said that uh, uh, the heat from 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 the body of the uh, uh, telescope th that is uh, you know that that has to be dissipated and uh, there won't be enough to really uh, you know cause any problems now the only instrument which uh, could have a problem is the mid infrared instrument because there the wavelength is a little short is i mean is a little longer so uh, so that instrument has a cryo cooler on board so that keeps that instrument co co cool which is this which is di di distributed infrared how we manage that i don't know what you mean what is distributed infrared i don't understand that question That's it. Okay, thank you. So a lot of questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for providing a wonderful insight about the James Webb Space Telescope. And I would like to also thank, on behalf of uh, Thames Tech Solution, uh, thank uh, School of Aeronautics Management Principal and other uh, dignitaries who have been gathered here in this particular event. And uh, of course, our dear students and participants who have been listening to you, the valuable information that they have gathered in from this particular session. So once again, thank you, ma'am, for providing such an precious time. Namaste, ma'am. OK, thank you. It was a pleasure. And uh, I hope you'll go to the NASA website, JWST website, to learn more about it. Thank, thank you, you so much, ma'am.